We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. Days after the United Nations documented that Israel had struck a hospital where thousands of Palestinians had taken refuge in Gaza, the hospital suffered a direct hit yesterday. Five to 800 people are confirmed dead. Many, many more are injured. Huge numbers of those who are dead and wounded are children under the age of five and their mothers. Welcome to The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today, we're talking with Professor Mohammed Morandi. He is an expert on American studies and post-colonial literature. He teaches at the University of Tehran in Iran. Professor Morandi, welcome back to The Socialist Program. Thank you very much for having me. Mohammed, the uh, people of the Middle East, the people of the world, Certainly even people inside the United States are shocked over what's been happening to the people of Gaza in the last nine or 10 days. There's no question at all that the Israeli Defense Forces are engaged in collective punishment against a civilian population. People in Gaza, two million of them live there. Most of the people, or at least half, are, are children, are under the age of 18. And now we have this terrible attack, bombing of a hospital where everyone knew Palestinians from all over Gaza had taken refuge. The UN said a couple days ago that the Israelis were targeting that hospital. Now it's been basically destroyed. Uh, the Israeli government says, no, it's not us. Uh, it's an, uh, a rocket that misfired. It's an errant rocket from Islamic Jihad or something like that. We're not to blame. Uh, the Palestinian people and the Palestinian authorities in Gaza say, yes, this was an Israeli airstrike. People all over the Middle East are in the streets. Uh, it seems that we are on the verge of a major escalation, uh, given the sheer and obvious uh, barbarism of the attacks on Gaza. Anyway, I want to start there, get your thoughts. It's obvious that it was the Israeli regime. No rocket could do such damage and kill so many people. Anyone who knows anything about war knows that that is a lie. And the Israeli president just a couple of days earlier said there's no real distinction between civilians and uh, the different resistance groups in Gaza. And that is something that many other Israelis have repeated for, have been repeating for days. What is surprising and what is disturbing, uh, just as much as the fact that the Israelis are so genocidal, that's not surprising. What is disturbing and surprising is that Biden would go on record as blaming the victims. And the Western media, the corporate media, the state media has been trying very desperately to blame the victim somehow so that the Israeli regime can get away with this crime. So not only are they trying to assist the Israeli regime in this regard, but also they are encouraging the regime to carry out further atrocities. Because now the Israelis know no matter what genocidal act they carry out, the United States, the U.S. president, Western governments, and Western media will try to protect them. So these are crimes against humanity, and the Americans and the Europeans and the Western media, for the most part, they are guilty like the Israelis, because of their support for the regime and for trying to hide the facts about this crime. 
people might not fully understand, Mohammed, that a, a very huge attack against the civilian population target, like a hospital, actually could be viewed as something that was significant from the point of view of military strategy. In other words, not simply an overzealous pilot or missile operator, but something intentional. Um, I'm thinking back to the way the Iran-Iraq war came to an end. In 1988, uh, an Iranian civilian airliner carrying maybe almost 300 people uh, took off from Iran and a U.S. missile from a, from a U.S. ship shot it down. And at first, the United States said, oh, no, no, we didn't do it. It's not us. Then they said, no, it was us, but it was a mistake. But the U.S. had a very particular goal at that time uh, in the Iran-Iraq war. The U.S. had been flagging Kuwaiti oil tankers that had clearly been supporting the Iraqi uh, and other Iraq allies' war efforts against Iran. This was short, just a few years after the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Uh, and the U.S. had decided that they, the U.S. couldn't actually defeat Iran, so it wanted to end the conflict, and Iran, uh, you know, was obviously still fighting. And the, the shoot-down of the civilian airliner was such a huge event. The, the magnitude of the violence against civilians, it had a shocking impact, and, and in fact— at least an armistice, maybe you, you'll know more because it's a long time ago and you were there and actually uh, part of all of that, that sort of changed the political equation in the, in the Gulf War. Anyway, my point is that targeting civilians is purposeful and is part of military strategy. It's a crime. It's a crime against humanity, clearly. It's a violation of the Geneva Convention. It's a violation of the Nuremberg Accords. But just your thought about that, because uh, the, US, the, the Israelis actually are trying to accomplish something here by killing large numbers of Palestinians in Gaza. Actually, there are uh, some significant parallels between the two. When the United States downed the Iranian airliner, the Americans lied. Uh, the U.S. Vice President at that time, Bush, the father, he went in the UN Security Council and said that the airplane was flying outside its civilian corridor and that it was not rising. It was moving towards it was moving towards the naval ship, the American naval ship, and that it was sending threatening messages to the Americans. Years later, even though all the evidence was there, the Iranians had all the evidence on that they had the radar, they had the recordings, but the Western media ignored it completely. Years later, Newsweek told the truth. And that is how the United States does things. They when it's when the the crime takes place, they hide it or they try to uh, fabricate uh, information so to muddy the waters and then later years later when it's no longer a sensitive topic then the reality comes out and what the israeli regime and the americans and the much of the western media and the elites are trying to do is they're trying to raise questions about who actually carried out this attack in gaza to distract attention away from the israeli regime's atrocities Two years from now, three years from now, when the dust settles, that's the plan would be to say, yes, it's now confirmed that the Israelis carried out this missile attack and the pilot, it was a, the pilot made an error or he was, you know, and, and so they'll, and then there, the reaction will be very little compared to what it would be now if it's very clear for everyone. Of course, everyone in our region knows what happened, and any sane person knows that the Israelis carried it out. As I said before, no rocket, uh, no rocket that the resistance has, if misfired, could cause that sort of damage. 
and the evidence has already been shown that there is that there's no chance there's no way that a rocket could have struck there so this is this is just misinformation to help the Israeli regime get away with this and yes why is the why are the Israelis murdering uh, Palestinians because it's not just this hospital this hospital is the most bloody and the most ugly of the attacks but it's a fraction of the total number that have been massacred so far this genocide has uh, caused thousands of Palestinians to die and well over a thousand Palestinian kids maybe up to 2,000, I don't know the numbers right now, uh, have been murdered so far by the Israelis. And the reason is, I think, uh, quite clear. The Israelis want to ethnically cleanse Gaza. They want the Palestinians to leave. They want another Nekba. They want the, just like in 19, uh, just like when the Israeli regime was created, and they forced the palace, they slaughtered Palestinians and forced the rest to leave their land. They want to do this again. And the irony, of course, is that the people of Gaza are refugees from Palestine. Most of the people of Gaza are actually from southern Palestine. Gaza was a small village uh, many decades ago. And so all of these people fled to Gaza. And now the Israeli regime wants to get rid of them for a second time. They want them to go to Egypt so that they can take the territory for themselves. And the more the people resist, and it is extraordinary. I think it is utterly, it is extremely heroic for these people to stay put. They will not leave because they don't want history to repeat itself. So people remain under fire in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in schools and in hospitals because they don't want to leave. Because they know if they leave, the Israelis will never let them back. So the objective is to is shock and awe. It is to slaughter as many Palestinians as possible to get rid of the population so that the Israelis could have that territory for themselves. But what I find, as I said earlier, to be shocking is the degree to which the Europeans and the Americans are going along with this. No criticism whatsoever. In the past, at least the Europeans would criticize the Israeli regime. They wouldn't do anything about it. They'd still continue to fund it and to support it, but they'd criticize it. Now, no, it's just full support. Keep on killing Palestinians. And today, we've seen large numbers of Palestinians killed. Why? Because the Israelis know that they're not going to be punished. They know that they're not even going to be criticized. They know that the West is going to hide their crimes. And this is, uh, this is a repetition of sorts of something that I experienced in the Iran-Iraq war that you raised. And that was the use of chemical weapons. The West provided Saddam Hussein with chemical weapons. They provided the political cover for him to get away with those crimes, and they provided him military intelligence to to use those to better use those weapons. And in the UN Security Council, they refused to condemn him. And then only years later, were they will even though the Iranians had provided the evidence, only years later, when Saddam invaded Kuwait, did this suddenly become an issue, and the Americans were talking about Saddam's chemical weapons as if this was a, a new issue. And 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 the, and and Bush at that time, the father again, spoke about how Saddam used chemical weapons against his own people and against the Iranians, whereas. When he was doing those things, it was with the full consent and support of the United States and its European allies. The day after the world learned about the use by Iraq of chemical weapons, again, as you said, Mohammed, provided by France and the Western powers, including U.S. companies, during the Iran-Iraq war, that was 1983, Donald Rumsfeld, who, was, who later became the defense minister, secretary of defense, 
under the George W. Bush administration, he was the special envoy to the Middle East from Ronald Reagan at that time. This was 1983. And there's pictures, and people can go on the internet and look it up for themselves. Rumsfeld shows up in Baghdad. The world is just hearing about the use of chemical weapons, which were banned after the horrendous use of them in World War I. And he's hugging Saddam Hussein. People would be surprised because Donald Rumsfeld said later when the U.S. was needed a pretext to carry out the invasion of Iraq, the shock and awe invasion of Iraq in, in an effort to create a, a puppet regime of its own, of its own making, then Saddam was uh, the monster who had weapons of mass destruction. But Donald Rumsfeld is actually hugging and kissing Saddam Hussein that day in 1983 the day after the revelation comes out that Iraq is actually using chemical weapons. Again, for people who are trying to follow this and may seem confused, the U.S. doesn't actually care about the form of government in Iran or the form of government in Iraq. The U.S. only wants puppets, basically. It only wants proxy forces. And if the proxy has parliamentary elections once in a while or whether it's a complete uh, you know, monarchical dictatorship. It doesn't really matter if they're doing the bidding of the United States in this region, especially the where, you know, oil and other, it's such a resource rich region and geostrategically important. Uh, I think it's just important for people to recognize that. But Israel, Mohammed, at least since 1967, when the Israelis launched the war against their neighbors where they stole the West Bank and Gaza and the Golan Heights in Syria and big parts of Egypt uh, at a time when the U.S. was bogged down in the war in Vietnam and couldn't itself stop what was at that time a rising tide of revolution in the Middle East. The U.S., I think, decided to rely on Israel as the projection of American power, along with the Shah of Iran. Uh, you know, it was the Nixon doctrine, relying on a, Iran under a monarchy imposed on the Iranian people by the United States and the Israeli government that has parliamentary elections, but nonetheless was a loyal ally or, you know, supplicant to the U.S. and as, as a consequence, a projection of American power. People have to understand that behind the Israeli war and the reason for this undying, seemingly undying support from the United States, now Biden is there hugging and kissing Netanyahu, who has embarked on obviously a fascistic path inside of Israeli politics. This is because the U.S. is viewing everything from the lens of its own geostrategic interests. It's not that they care about Jews, not that they care about anybody. This is like raw power, but sort of dressed up with these other rationales. Yes, and uh, it's really uh, extraordinary that the United States is relying on the Israeli regime uh, to, or has been for many decades, to impose U.S. will on this region. But in reality, at least for the last two, three decades, the existence of the Israeli regime has been detrimental to the interests of the United States. It, the United States is paying a price in every particular way possible because of the actions of the Israeli regime, because it is brutal, because it is barbaric, because it is undemocratic and an apartheid regime. It is hated across the region, it's hated across North Africa, it's hated across West Asia. And it's because of the Israeli regime that U.S. policies in this region are formulated, whether it's against Syria or against Iraq or Iran or in Libya or Yemen. Uh, all of the destruction that we've seen caused by the Americans in this region, which have led to many millions of people leaving the region, leaving for Europe and causing uh, Tensions in Europe because of uh, the, the the rise of uh, immig immigrants uh, as well as refugees. All of these are because of Western policies. It has. Uh, if the United States had not supported apartheid in our region, if 
Israel was dismantled and a state that was tolerant of to, that tolerated both Muslims or Muslims, Christians, and Jews together, then West Asia, North Africa, the whole of the Mediterranean, it would have been an, a region of peace and stability and uh, economic growth in the south of the Mediterranean and the north of the Mediterranean and the east of the Mediterranean would be much greater and more profitable for ordinary people than today. But instead, we have misery across the region. The United States has destroyed the region, much of the region, and it's all because of the Israeli regime. So it serves no purpose for the Americans. It serves uh, nothing but the interests of a, 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 an apartheid, colonial, uh, despotic, brutal uh, apartheid regime. Uh, and uh, and I believe that this this situation cannot last much longer. I do not believe that the Israeli regime will last. I don't believe that the Americans can continue to prop it up for a very long time. As the United States and Europe decline, uh, the fortunes of the regime will uh, decline further because Israel is not a strong regime. It is not powerful. It is, I mean, it is a small territory with a small population. What props it up is the enormous amount of wealth and uh, weaponry that the Europeans and the Americans constantly supply. But as the Europeans grow weaker, as the Americans grow weaker, that means that the Israelis also become weaker. So this situation is not sustainable. And however, in whatever way the Americans would like to interpret recent events, it was a massive blow to the regime. It was a it was an unprecedented blow to the regime. The defeat that the Israelis have faced uh, is greater than the defeat that they face uh, in 2005 against uh, Hezbollah. And the atrocities that the Israelis are committing in Gaza, I think, are just as destructive for the image of the regime and for the supposed legitimacy of the regime uh, as the defeat on the battlefield was itself. The narrative, Mohammed, in the U.S. media, and certainly by the supporters of Israel, is that Hamas carried out this aggression on October 7th and it stormed into Israel. The Israeli defense forces obviously were taken by surprise. Lots of civilians, lots of Israeli civilians were killed. So kind of Hamas started this. Hamas began this. And, you know, if you just look at the story if, if the story begins October 7th, it's like if you walk into a movie and you come in like four-fifths of the way through and you see like a gunfight or you see somebody killing somebody else, you would think like, oh, now I understand this movie. But of course, you don't understand the movie because you missed the first four-fifths of it. And I think it's important for people to try to understand the context. If, you, if we go back to the time since... Hamas became the elected and, you know, legitimate government in Hamas, which was, you know, around in the, in 2007, I believe. Um, periodically, the Israelis and the government in Hamas or the Palestinians come to some sort of an agreement to reduce tensions. And for a while, uh, there's kind of like a, a sort of an interlude where tensions re are reduced. And, if you look at this record, and if I want people to go back and look for themselves, each and every time, uh, the Palestinian side is basically adhering to the agreements, whatever they are, these temporary agreements. And then eventually the Israelis start to carry out additional provocations, additional attacks, the tension becomes greater, eventually Hamas or other forces who are other resistance forces in Gaza start to respond. 
And then that becomes the pretext, the, Israel, the Palestinian response, which is now framed as Palestinian aggression, and that becomes the pretext for what the Israelis call the occasional mowing the grass, meaning going into, uh, into Gaza and like basically blowing stuff up, killing lots of people, showing who's boss, showing that the Israelis are still dominating. And then there's an agreement, and then there's a period of interlude, and then the thing starts up again. And again, people, don't take my word for it. Go and do some of your own research to see that this is, in fact, the pattern. My point is, Mohammed, what was going on before October 7th that would have created a situation where Hamas or the Palestinian resistance forces decided at that moment to take the military initiative. And again, I wanna remind people, if you think about a war and try to think who is the aggressor and who is the victim of aggression, only by uh, sort of examining who fired the first shot at a particular moment, you're not gonna understand very much. In 1830, Nat Turner in the slave revolt in the South took the initiative and they stormed into some of the slave owners' homes and killed everybody. Uh, but if people think back and say, well, the slaves were obviously the aggressors because they, on a certain date, took a military initiative against those who had enslaved them, you're kind of missing the big picture. Uh, anyway, let's just talk about what were the events, what are the things that were so impactful for Palestinians in Gaza and elsewhere in the run-up to October 7th. I, again, I think this is part of the story that most Americans, certainly, who are getting their news from the mainstream media don't know anything about and certainly don't understand. Well, it's sort of like what happened in Lebanon, and I think I mistakenly said the 2000, I think it's, the, I should have said the 2006 war. Right. In Lebanon, the Israelis invaded the country in 1982. And it took, and it was during that invasion that Hezbollah was actually created. And Hezbollah led the resistance against the Israeli regime and ultimately expelled them from Lebanon. So Hezbollah was a national liberation organization. And after the Israeli regime was expelled, they kept many Lebanese prisoners and had no intention of freeing them. So Hezbollah carried out an attack and captured two Israeli soldiers. And that led to the 33-day uh, war. So if you look at it from that, the point when Hezbollah captured those two soldiers, then you could say Hezbollah started the war. But that's not when the war started. The war started in 1982, when the Israelis captured more than half of Lebanon and captured Beirut, the capital. And during the resistance, Hezbollah and others, a number of their people were captured and held prisoner. So the Israelis had to release them and Hezbollah captured those soldiers to force them to, to force the Israelis to release them. So Hezbollah had every right to launch that strike. So if you look at it within the broader context, then everything that Hezbollah did make, did make sense. The same is true in Gaza. In Gaza, we have the world's greatest, largest open-air prison, a concentration camp where the Israelis don't allow even an appropriate amount of food to enter. They don't allow certain medicines to enter Gaza. They don't allow sick Gazans to easily go to hospitals for uh, diseases or for problems that cannot be solved in Gaza. It is a concentration camp where people are born and die. And every three, four years, as you said, the Israelis mow the grass. In other words, they carry out atrocities like what we're seeing right now to where they kill hundreds and sometimes thousands of civilians. They also call it the Dahiyeh Doctrine. Dahiyeh is, 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 is in southern Beirut. It is, uh, it is a, a neighborhood where, which is predominantly Shia, and many people who are supporters of Hezbollah live in that neighborhood. 
So what would the Israelis do in order to put pressure on Hezbollah? They would bomb the civilians of Dahia. They would bomb that. I was, in fact, I was in Dahia a few months before the war in 2006, and I went again to Dahia a few months later, after the war. The whole neighborhood was leveled to the ground. Huge apartment blocks were all leveled to the ground. And these, these crimes were committed with Western support. And every time they would bring down an apartment block, they would say there was a terrorist in that building. And the Western media would quickly repeat everything that the Israelis said to justify the mass murder of civilians. So just like the scenes that you're showing right now, that's exactly what they would do to Beirut, to the southern Beirut, the, Do the Dahia Doctrine. So the Israeli regime would, re would constantly, every two, three years, attack Gaza. So people would, are, are in a prison. They don't have proper jobs. They don't even, even proper food and medicine are not allowed, or adequate amounts of food and medicine aren't allowed into Gaza. The drinking water is, according to the UN, uh, is almost non-existent. This is what these people, these, is, these are what children in Gaza are born and brought up to see throughout their lives. Every three years or four years, they have to go through the terror of mass bombardment. And every two, one or two months, there are airstrikes. So they live in terror. So when this attack was, when this attack took place, it was a jailbreak. It was a revolt of the slaves against these despotic and illegitimate and cruel masters. So there, the, there is no moral equivalence. The apartheid regime, the colonial regime, where most of its people came from Europe, and many of them don't even look Middle Eastern, they have battered these people for many decades. And these people who broke out of jail, it's worse than a slave revolt. Because this, the slave revolt that you alluded to was was carried out by slaves that were brought to America. The slave revolt in Gaza are the slaves who own the land. They broke out of prison and went to see the land of their parents. All of that land belongs to them. These people, as I said earlier, their parents came from southern Palestine. So they are not only slaves, but they're the slaves who own the land. So if, if a few, if, if in a slave revolt, a few ma neighbors of the master are killed or a couple of children are killed, obviously any child that dies, that's tragic. But that does not change the moral legitimacy of their resistance and it does not create a, an equivalence of, uh, of morality. There is no moral equivalence here. It is the Palestinian cause is a just cause. And Hamas and all the other groups have every right to stand up and resist. Mm -hmm. And even, even if we were to accept the argument that Hamas killed innocent people, and we know that that narrative is, has been, in many respects, debunked. The 40 uh, babies that were beheaded, lies. The, uh, the women that were raped, lies. Even those who were partying, the images that have come out show that the Israelis were shooting from among these people. They were using them as human shields. And, of course, uh, some of the people who were in the party also acknowledge this. The footage shows this. They acknowledge it. But in addition to that, they're adults. It, it's extraordinary that, on the one hand, when the Israeli regime wants to promote 
their armed forces, they often show pictures of young women wearing t tight uniforms and carrying uh, submachine guns to, to make the Israeli armed forces look really cool and attractive. But then when these young women are killed, then suddenly uh, innocents are being massacred by Hamas. All adults, according to what we hear from the Israelis themselves, join the armed forces. So, no, there is no moral equivalence. The Palestinians are the victims. The Israelis are the, are the people who are carrying out constantly constantly carrying out atrocities and the atrocities that we're seeing today are more uh, are more vicious and more devastating than even previous atrocities and the amount of support open support coming from western officials under these circumstances is greater than we've ever seen before there's a, a very strong element of selective outrage uh, in the U.S. media, Mohammed, in 2018, these the same people in Gaza, in as you described it, this open air prison, didn't engage in armed uh, resistance. They they peacefully protested using purely nonviolent tactics at what was called the Great March of Return. Every Friday, going to the wall, and hundreds of these peaceful protesters, including children, including journalists were deliberately shot dead by IDF, Israeli Defense Force snipers. Thousands and were medics. wounded. Say it and again. And medics. And medics, And yes. medics. Yeah, people who are clearly, you know, had the emblems, the uh, uh, symbols of being a medic, they're shot dead. And thousands were wounded. Thousands were shot from fire with firearms. And I can tell you over here where I am in the United States, there was no big outrage. There was no like, how dare this government shoot down nonviolent protesters? And the reality is that when a government, and especially an occupation government, this was true in India, it was true in Rhodesia, it was true in South Africa, it's true in Palestine. When the occupying government, a government of illegal occupation that seizes the lands of the indigenous people makes nonviolent protest impossible because it will be met with gunfire, then it makes armed resistance inevitable. So we're silent in the West about the killing of nonviolent protesters and then shocked when people turn to armed resistance. Uh, again, this is the important part of the framing. What happened in 2018 to those nonviolent protesters, you see them right there, they're nonviolent. And they're shot dead. They're shot dead. And again, complete and utter silence on the part of the media. So, of course, we all care about any human being being killed in war, especially civilians. When you see the pictures of people who went to a party and they're now dead or children who are now dead, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, race, you can't not be moved. You have to be moved. You have to care as a human being. But the selectivity of the who we care about and when we care about them is so pronounced that it clearly has to be understood as propaganda in the United States. It is propaganda when we when we are taught that when and even people, some people who are liberals say, well, of course, we condemn the Hamas attacks on civilians. OK. Fine. Then when it comes to the mass killing of civilians in Gaza, they say, and we hope to pressure our government to pressure the Israeli government to minimize civilian casualties. Like, in other words, kind of a passive response, not the same emotion, not the same passion about the civilians. It's this kind of selectivity. And again, it's racism, but it's a racism that has been premised on really essentially the foreign policy needs of the U.S. government to show that Israel is always the good guy and their victims are always the bad guy. So the, the people who engage in terrorism against civilians are called act, actors in self-defense and the people who fight back against there are considered terrorists. Anyway, this is something we know over and over again.
what I want to talk to you about is the big picture here, because you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, that this was a huge setback outside of Let's dis not for a moment talk about the terribleness of the loss of human life. Let's look at it from the point of view of the military situation, the geostrategic situation, and the historical situation. That you're saying the state of Israel, the settler project, has suffered a very grievous defeat. You think it's a harbinger that eventually the colonial project will come to an end, that perhaps as happened for thousands of years, or at least a couple thousand years, Christians, Muslims, and Jews lived in this area in peace, uh, you know, actually at peace, where they were in, mer uh, where they were neighbors. That, that, that this will, that this anti-apartheid vision will return. And I want to also ask you more about that, but also Joe Biden went to Israel, went to Israel to show his support, but he was planning to meet with Arab leaders in Jordan at the summit uh, to sort of show that the U.S. was all not only all about Israel, but it had like Arab government leaders sort of on its side or neutralized. But the Arab leaders have canceled that summit. Uh, again, where where is it going? Where are we heading? Well, just one small footnote before I respond, and that is that with regards to the peaceful marches that we had in 2018, the Israelis were having, they were having target practice. They were having fun shooting the, the uh, marchers. The marchers were nowhere near them. They would, uh, they would uh, have, place bets on who could hit who, and often they would target people in the knees. So that they could uh, destroy their ability to walk uh, normally for the rest of their lives. And sometimes their sharpshooters would kill people kilometers away, including a young female medic. If, if you recall, she became somewhat iconic in during that whole affair. But yes, the Israelis have suffered a, a humiliating defeat. And here in China, I've been in China over the last few days, Chinese colleagues and friends speak of their surprise about the vulnerability of the Israeli regime and the fundamental weakness of the regime because it always gave an image of itself as somehow invincible and the most powerful uh, actor in, in that part of the world. But the Chinese, say that they have their image of Israel has changed completely. And the fact that they're massacring people has turned ordinary people against the regime. No matter how the United States tries, no how matter the Europeans desperately try to hide the truth and to blame the victims, which itself is just as disgusting and ugly as the crime itself, no one no one is buying it. No one believes it. And China is far off from the region. Across West Asia and North Africa, the outrage is extraordinary. It is so bad, it is so it is so intense that as you pointed out, leaders that are very close to the United States refuse to meet uh, and have a summit because they know their people won't accept it. So Popular opinion in the region is very angry. Its hostility is not just directed towards Israel, it's directed towards NATO as a whole. And the United States at, is at the top of the list. Countries that had relations with Israel or wanted to have relations with Israel have now are now forced to step back. And it comes at a time when the United States and the Europeans are losing a war in Europe. So they are, on the one hand, fighting and supporting the Israeli regime, antagonizing people across the region and across the world. And at the same, and simultaneously, they're losing a war against Russia and Ukraine. 
things are not going well for the West and things are not going well for the Israeli regime. This is not uh, something that is sustainable for good. And Brian, you remember the apartheid regime in South Africa quite well. I was a young activist at that time. So I, there were two causes that I was pursuing more than any other. One was as a young activist. One was against apartheid in South Africa, and the other was against apartheid in Palestine. I certainly didn't expect, and I don't think any of those people, any of those, or any of my mentors who were guiding me through politics and encouraging me to support the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and ANC, among other groups, and Nelson Mandela, among other resistance leaders. I don't recall anyone predicting the fall of apartheid South Africa so rapidly and so suddenly. The expectation was that it would last a long time, a lot longer than it actually did. So when things begin to fall apart, often it seems it's become they, they, things unfold much more rapidly than we predict. I think that the fate of the Israeli regime is sealed. I don't think it will last. I think we have we will see dark days ahead. I'm not. Uh, naive. I don't think it will end as peacefully as it did in South Africa, even though what happened after the fall of apartheid was no, no utopia was created and many of the injustices remained in place, but that's a different story. But I don't see the regime as being able to sustain itself under these changing circumstances, both in the region and across the world. The support that it needs is not enough anymore. And the antagonism that exists towards apartheid, colonialism, and ethnic cleansing is stronger than it was before. Time will tell, but I, I'm confident that the fate of the Israeli regime is sealed. You know, before World War II, when the Zionist movement was one current within the Jewish community in Europe, it was a minority, it was a minority view. Uh, most European Jews were not thinking of going to Palestine or Uganda, which was another option for the Zionist colonial project. And all of the initial Zionist uh, founders always considered Zionism to be successful would have to be a colonial project would have to be sponsored by and an extension of one of the colonial powers of Europe. And all of, the, all of the world at that time was colonized. So it was sort of within the concept of colonization. But European Jewry, uh, which was suffering from, even be outside of fascism and Nazism and, and, and the fascist terror that led to the, to the genocide against Jews and others during World War II, there were pro pogroms all over the place, Tsarist Russia, Eastern Europe, France. I mean, the level of anti-Semitism and hatred of Jewish people was, was very obvious, and everybody knew about it, the ghettoization of Jews. But the Jewish people in Europe didn't think they wanted to go to West Asia or to North Africa. They wanted to get rid of anti-Semitism in Europe. They wanted to have the boot heel of discrimination and racism lifted off of their throat. It took really the fascist Holocaust in Europe and the concerted efforts by British colonialism and American imperialism to sort of uh, shift and, and change the way most of world Jewry thought about the state of Israel. The reason I'm mentioning this is that a lot of times people think of this as a conflict between people or between religions and not recognizing the dynamism that you're mentioning that happens when there are sudden sharp changes and breaks in history and things that seem out impossible, suddenly not only, impo not only possible, but seemingly inevitable, like the end of apartheid in South Africa. As we're talking, Mohammed, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people in the United States are 
organizing against the siege of Gaza. They're organizing against the Israeli government's war against the, the Palestinian residents in Gaza. That doesn't mean they're for this or that group in the Palestinian movement, but they've turned. There's been a sharp change in public opinion, especially among young Jewish people who don't want to be identified with racism, don't want to be identified with Netanyahu's apartheid policy. And perhaps in the first days after October 7th, everybody was in a kind of a state of shock and not moving. But now there are big demonstrations by American Jews demanding an end to the siege of Gaza. I think it's an indication of what you're saying, that ultimately, if, if the regime in Israel is based on being a settler government with the support of Jews from around the world, and, and that was pretty obvious in the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, but that is now changing, and more and more Jewish people are repulsed by these policies, even if they're not 100% with the program of the Palestinian resistance, for whatever reason, they're changing. And I think that's a bellwether. I think that's an indicator uh, of what you said, the sort of the fragility of a colonial project. And I just wonder, you know, as we look at what's going on internally in the United States or internally in Europe or internally in the Jewish community, then there's these other elements of this very dynamic situation because there are resistance forces in the Middle East. In Lebanon, of course, there is the Iranian government and probably, and you can testify whether this is accurate or not, a strong, very strong sentiment within Iran that's in solidarity and sympathy with the people of Palestine. Uh, you have lots of other places in the Middle East where, as you said, people are feeling like so frustrated and so angry that, that the Israelis are getting away with this in a way, you know, able to, they're not being, there's not like a regional response. I'm just wondering, will there be a regional response? Will governments or mass movements be stirred to action uh, as these atrocities accumulate? Again, all of these things, all of these component elements of the geostrategic sort of position shouldn't be looked at just by themselves. You have to look at the whole mix to get a sense of, of where things are moving. Anyway, I want to get your thoughts. Well, two things. One is I agree completely about Jews, not only in the United States, but across the world, even inside uh, Palestine, or what's called Israel today, a, a significant minority, not large, but still significant. Uh, they have always been opposed to the uh, Zionist ideology and the apartheid entity and ethnic cleansing, and Jews in Europe, in the United States, significant segments of the population have always been opposed to the regime, uh, but that those numbers are increasing. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, alternative uh, media outlets and sources of information exist today, which didn't exist so much in the past. But even in the past, when there was more of a, a monopoly of information, even back then there were hero, very heroic Jews in Europe and the United States that stood for the Palestinian people and who paid a very heavy price. Uh, they were marginalized. I know uh, a person I'm, that you've heard of. Uh, she was at some point a, an intern for APAC. Uh, she later on went to the State Department and worked in the White House, and she became a sharp critic of the Israeli regime, supported uh, people in our region, and even though she studied law at the most prestigious university in the United States, she, she's been marginalized. So, uh, and, and she was at university and no longer teaches at university. So people have paid heavy prices. Jews, non-Jews, but many people in the United States have paid, and, and elsewhere, have paid a heavy price for supporting uh, the Palestinian people and the, their right to return and their right to live as equal human beings. 
And we should always keep that in mind. And we see those voices today uh, magnifying and having an impact, a huge impact. Thus, the uh, gathering of American Jews in protest to the, to the regime. With regards to the region, I think that the more the Israelis kill Palestinians, the more dangerous it becomes for the regime. And I don't mean that the regime will be undermined today or tomorrow, but there is a change taking place in this region. First of all, Hezbollah, Iran, many militia groups across the region, the Iraqi armed forces, the Yemeni armed forces, they are right now prepared for conflict. So the regime is making things more dangerous, not only for itself, but for its Western allies. Because for example, if they push much further, or if the Americans intervene, then I think the United States will lose everything in Iraq. And if the United States loses everything in Iraq, it will lose everything in Syria as well. The Americans cannot control their assets or their or retain or protect their interests in Iraq if the Iraqi people and Iraqi the the Hashid or the armed forces or Iraqis rise up against the Americans. They'll lose their embassy, they'll lose their military bases, they'll lose all of their investments, all of that will be gone. And then the Americans, as I said, they cannot occupy Syria without having Iraq. So uh, an escalation would be very damaging for the United States. And remember, we always have to keep in mind, because the war in Ukraine is sort of forgotten now. No one is talking about it anymore. But it's, it's going on. Day and night, there's intense fighting across the battlefield. And the Russians are going to advance. They're going to move forward. They're going to take new positions. Uh, as things stand, in, in my opinion, it, the Ukrainians are going to lose this war. And it's, it's the, the major defeats are not far off. So if the Americans want a multiple battlefield where the Russians are advancing in Ukraine and they are losing control in Iraq and Syria, then that is what they're going to get. If, if that's what they want, that's what they're going to get. But I think that that would be a devastating blow for the United States. So it's the, the, it is not in the interest of the Israeli regime to escalate. But by carrying out this massacre, and by continuing to massacre people after the atrocity on the, in the hospital, I think escalation to some degree is inevitable. You, you already see heavy fighting in uh, alongside the Lebanese border. Right now, as we speak, there's heavy fighting going on between Hezbollah and the Israelis. And so when you have escalation, then there are more variables and there are more questions and it's, it becomes unclear. Things can spiral out of control. So if the Americans get involved, I think they will be expelled from important parts of the region very swiftly. If the Israelis escalate further, Hezbollah will hammer them very hard. And they, and they are much more vulnerable than Hezbollah. Most of Hezbollah's assets are underground. The Israeli assets are on the ground. So if, and, and Lebanon, because of the U.S. sanctions and because of hostility from Western countries, doesn't have the sort of assets that the Israeli regime has. The Israelis have much more to lose, regardless of the fact that they're fighting another battle in the South. So a continuation of the current situation hurts Israel, 
increased tensions hurts Israel and the Americans and the Europeans. And so it's a lose-lose situation. The smart thing for the Israeli regime to do would, to, would be to end it now and to cut their losses. But even if they do that, it's a major blow. This is not this is this is not some small battle. This is this has dented the regime's reputation both as a fighting force, but also it is exposed to younger the young in Iran. Brian, in Iran, the outrage towards Israel is unprecedented. Many young people don't remember the atrocities that I remember. For example, Ghana and the other outrages committed by the Israelis. They don't remember 10 years ago or even five years ago. But for the first time in their life, they're seeing scenes from Palestine that, that disgust them. So in Iran, people are outraged. So what the Israelis have done is that they've turned a, a generation of young Iranians that some were hostile towards Israel, they are more ideological or politically aware, and many were indifferent. But now, very few are indifferent. And I'm sure that that is the case across the Arab world as well, and probably beyond, across the global south, if not in many parts of Europe and the United States. So the damage done to Israel is not something that you or I could even calculate. Really important um, perspective, Mohammed. I want to thank you. Uh, for those of us who are, you know, participating in this alternative media on our show, or we're also in the streets organizing protests against the siege of Gaza and, and, and standing with the Palestinian people's struggle against apartheid and against occupation, you know, there's only so much that we can control. You know, we're not the government, we're not any government, we're not you know, we're not associated in any way. But what we do have the ability to do, and I believe the duty to do, is to try to help people understand the underlying issues so that when you are uh, confronted with a sort of the, the propagandized version of the war by US mainstream media, which echoes Israeli propaganda and the propaganda of the, of the empire and the propaganda of the military industrial complex, people have a hard time navigating to be able to sort of come up with a counter narrative. So from our point of view, we can't control everything that's going on. We can only control what we do. And what we do in, and what we should do is to tell the truth, uh, to look at this struggle from the point of view of uh, a struggle for justice, not to become pessimistic. And as you're saying, dynamic change happens so suddenly and you never know where you are in the historical continuum until sort of after the fact. But what we do matters. What people, uh, what they do, what we do matters. And so, Mohammed Morandi, I want to thank you so much. I know it's very, very, very late where you are. But Muhammad is a truth teller, so find him on social media and uh, read his work and follow him. Uh, Muhammad Morandi, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much for having me.